Yo, what's up guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be reacting to Vadi Vidya's Bloodborne story explained. I asked you guys in the final episode of Bloodborne which lore videos you wanted me to react to. Clearly, I can't get enough of this game. I figured this would help me to kind of put an end to it so we can start Dark Souls Remastered. I will link the original video down in the description below. We're just going to chill back, relax, and watch what seems to be an amazing video. It has 11 million views. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited. If you are too, make sure to drop a like. It helps out the channel. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate you. Let's get into some lore. The oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. H.P. Lovecraft. I love that. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. <laughs> fear the old blood. These were the words spoken between Master Willem and Lawrence. From the cautious teacher to the ambitious student, Fear what you do not understand. Fear the old blood. And so our story begins, as you might have guessed, with blood. Ancient blood. Deep below the city of Yarnum lies the ancient underground labyrinth of Tumeru. You know it as the Chalice Dungeon. Sorry that I'm pausing already, but I just need to say, I have seen some comments of you guys wanting me to go through the Chalice Dungeons, and that is something that I want to do as a whole video, maybe like a two-part series. You know, at first I wanted to really stick to the story, but it has come to my attention that it actually has some really deep lore kind of rooted within, no pun intended. We will be checking those out, and that's all I wanted to say. I wonder if this is, this is probably going to spoil some stuff. Anyways, let's continue. The old labyrinth was carved out by the Tumerians, superhuman beings beings that are said to have discovered a sinister truth. The hunters had another name for the labyrinth. They called it the Tomb of the Gods, for below they found traces of godlike beings named the Great Ones. The Great Ones could function on transcendental planes of thought, meaning they had elevated their consciousness beyond the physical realm. The benefits of operating on this plane are unclear. Perhaps it was in the name of immortality, or perhaps power, as even beyond, the Great Ones could interfere with beings and events in the waking world. Whatever the case, it is clear that some sort of ascension took place, as there are numerous huh. references to some Great Ones being left behind. Of all the strange life forms that reside in the nooks and crannies of the old labyrinth, the slugs are clear signs of the left behind Great Ones. Okay, that is so freaking cool. That was a question that I had, and uh, I believe we read that item. And I gotta say, I love how this guy sources his material by adding on the video, like where he got the information from, from like certain item descriptions. I think that's so freaking cool. But okay, that's awesome. So the great ones came from from the dungeons, I guess. And this is this is awesome. I'm gonna stop pausing. I'm sorry, guys. We're only like a minute and thirty in. I'm sorry. Let's continue. One such great one appears to be abandoned Abritus. Abritus, a left classic. Being who apparently did I was not saying it wrong. with her brethren. <laughs> one day, Abritus would be discovered by the humans above in a crusade that begins with a character named Willem. <laughs> Master Willem presided over a prestigious place of learning, Bergenworth. Situated by a tranquil lake and secluded within a gigantic forest, Bergenworth housed the mines that would change the world. In so fact, cool. everything sacred in Yarnum came to be traced back to Bergenworth, including the most influential characters within our story. Bloodborne's lore is very character driven, and there are five who I'm going to help you become familiar with. Mm. There was Master Willem, Runesmith Carol, Lawrence, Mikalash, and German. I'll introduce them to you in the order that they become relevant in the story. Nice. As I said, Master Willem was the head of the school at Bergenworth. The man was obsessed with the truth and believed in pushing the limits of humanity. In almost every dialogue and description, Willem is referred to as Master or Provost, clearly deserving of a great deal of respect. Many would eventually diverge from his tutorage, but few can say that they didn't owe everything to his research, for while Willem presided over Bergenworth, the scholars there discovered terrific things in the tombs below the city of Yarnum. Classic. Once, a group of young Bergenworth scholars discovered a holy medium deep within the tomb. This led to the founding of the Healing Church and the establishment of blood healing. Oh. It's hard to be sure exactly what was found, but we do know it was related to the Great Ones. On the ground floor of Bergenworth College, we find the Pearl Slugs, remnants of the Great Ones, and at the very top of the college, we find the empty phantasm shell, an empty invertebrate shell that is said to be the familiar of a Great One. Mm. 
After this discovery, whatever it was that showed them that the Great Ones existed, the Bergenworth scholars launched an inquiry into the Great Ones and the Old Blood. For from this point onwards, there is an explosion of lore and history and references to what the scholars found in the tombs below Yarnum. Many of these references come from runesmith Carol, the second character of our story. Hmm. Carol transcribed the inhuman utterings of the Great Ones into what we now call Carol runes. In true Lovecraftian fashion, it is really likely that it's impossible for humans to comprehend the speech of the Great Ones, but Carol apparently had a knack, a talent, for creating a visual representation of the Great Ones' words. The hunter who receives this workshop tool can etch Carol runes into their mind to attain their wondrous strength. Provost oh. Willem would have been proud of Carol's runes, as they do not rely upon blood in any measure. This statement is curious. It tells us three things. First, Provost Willem and Carol were close, as Willem would have been proud of him. And second, Willem didn't have a chance to be proud, so it's possible that the two lost contact. And thirdly, and most importantly, Willem would have been proud because the runes did not rely on blood. In other words, Willem did not approve the use of the old blood, the blood found in the Tomb of the Gods. The Metamorphosis rune states, the discovery of blood made their dream of evolution a reality. Metamorphosis and the excesses and- <laughs> Wait, you can kill that guy? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> deviation that followed was only the beginning. Willem believed in a different path. He believed in attaining more insight, for humanity's eyes had yet to open. The Eye Rune states that Master Willem looked to beings from higher planes for guidance, and sought to line his brain with eyes mm. in order to elevate his thoughts. And with these descriptions, you should have some idea of the scale of ambition of these characters. With the discovery of beings greater than them came a desire to ascend into godhood, to push humanity into its next stage of evolution. The only question was how, blood or insight? And this was a question that split the ranks of the Bergenworth scholars. It's how we arrived at the cutscene we started at earlier with Master Willem and- Okay, 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 wow. Um, I feel like I'm not talking enough, but it's just because this video is so goddamn well made. It's hard to find a time to kind of pause the video, but- Okay, so my thoughts so far, I guess, Master Willem obviously wanted to help out humanity. That was his whole thing, right? So that, in my eyes, is, is quite noble in a way, but obviously I'm sure they'll explain a lot more on that. Obviously things didn't go as planned, right? That's really interesting though, the kind of conflict between the blood and the insight. It's really cool how they found things kind of underground that related to things, so students kind of parted ways with his teachings and whatnot. But anyways, let's continue. Master Willem, I've come to bid you farewell. Oh, I know, I know. You think now to betray me. From this cutscene, we can infer that Lawrence was a high-ranking student of Master Willem. Because firstly, Lawrence refers to Willem as Master. And secondly, Willem clearly regards Lawrence highly enough to call this departure a betrayal. Hmm. No. It all makes sense now. Listen. Lawrence disagrees. He does not see it as betrayal. And here, we come to the heart of what their disagreement is about. Essentially, it boils down to the difference between the two resources in the game. Willem believes man requires insight and knowledge to ascend. Mm. Lawrence believes in the power of blood. Lawrence attempts to reassure Willem, telling him he will always fear the old blood, <laughs> but that this fear will not stop him using it. I tell you, I will not forget our adage. We are born of the blood, made men by the blood, undone by the blood. Our eyes are yet to open. Fear the old blood. Hmm. I must take my leave. Lawrence leaves the Bergenworth scholars, presumably with a small group of rebels, and goes on to found the Healing Church. Right. Willem remains at Bergenworth and attempts to elevate his thoughts to a higher plane. He will return to our story at a later time, so while I tell you of what Lawrence went on to do, imagine Willem here in Bergenworth, sitting in his rocking chair <laughs> over the lake, musing on how to acquire insight and elevate his thoughts to a higher plane. 
Everything Lawrence would come to achieve was based on the knowledge he had come by in Bergenworth. In retrospect, we clearly see why Willem saw Lawrence's departure as a betrayal. Perhaps Willem himself even planted these ideas in Lawrence's mind. Hmm. A note in the lecture hall reads, Master Willem was right. Evolution without courage will be the ruin of our race. Lawrence had courage, but it is likely that his courage bordered on arrogance. The Bergenworth student uniform states, the Healing Church has its roots in Bergenworth and naturally borrows heavily from its uniform design. The focus right. not on knowledge or thought, but on pure pretension would surely bring Master Willem to despair if only he knew. So Lawrence threw caution to the wind and put his faith in the old blood. Think on human history. Imagine if, in any era, a church was founded that had access to a substance that could cure any illness. <laughs> Imagine if this church gave it freely to a city, how powerful that city would become, yeah. how powerful the church would become within it. This is exactly what happened in Yarnum. People came far and wide to be treated with the miraculous blood of the gods, and the people of Yarnum put their faith in the healing church. In fact, what happened in Yarnum is eerily similar to what happened in the tombs deep below, mm -hmm. where the blood was originally found. And as you know, many chalice dungeons, especially those of Loran, are now overrun by horrific beasts. Oh, the lower Loran chalice <laughs> states, there are trace remains are of medical looking. procedures in parts of ailing Loran. Whether these were attempts to control the scourge of the beasts or the cause of the outbreak is unknown. The ailing Loran chalice states, the tragedy that struck this ailing land of Loran is said to have its root in the scourge of the beast. Some have made the dreaded extrapolation that Yarnum may be next. Yarnum was next. Through overuse of the healing blood, the city would eventually succumb to the scourge of the beast. Until then though, Lawrence and the healing church managed to grow in power with the miraculous healing properties of their special yet infected blood. Yarnum grows to become a city of worship and fear. As you explore throughout the city, you see the influence of the church everywhere. With Yarnum's resources, Lawrence clearly had the power to grow the church beyond what would have been possible at Bergenworth. All the while, he continued exploring the labyrinth below Yarnum. The Tomb Prospector said reads, Attire of the Tomb Prospectors who explore the old labyrinth on behalf of the Healing Church. The Healing Church traces its roots to Bergenworth and is therefore aware of the ruins' true importance. These ruins contain much more than hunter trinkets. Indeed, they hide the very secrets of the old Great Ones, sought after by those with the insight to imagine greatness. Hmm. On top of this, Lawrence split the church into multiple branches, each with a different purpose. There was the choir, the school of Mensis, and the workshop. Right. We'll get to these branches as they become appropriate. But the main purpose of the church, at least to the people of Yarnum, was the administration of blood healing. Within the Grand Cathedral itself lies a note that says, Heir to the ritual of blood, purveyor of ministration, place your hand upon the altar's sacred covering and inscribe Master Lawrence's adage upon your flesh. Blood ministers would have been those who administered the blood healing. How else would the people of Yarnum be so obsessed with blood? In Yarnum, they produced more blood than alcohol, as the Jesus. former is more intoxicating. However, the ministration of blood was likely a means to an end, for the healing church still intended to commune with the Great Ones, in hopes of ascending humanity to a higher plane. This task was given to the choir, a group who were a part of the healing church. Members of the choir are both the highest ranking clerics of the healing church and scholars who continued the work that began at Bergenworth. The eye covering indicates their debt to the teachings of Master Willem, even though their paths diverged. The choir, garbed in black and white, with the familiar eye covering, occupied the upper cathedral ward. It seems to have been their job to research and make contact with the Great Ones. The Great Is Chalice became the cornerstone of the choir, the elite delegation of the Healing Church. It was also the first Great Chalice brought back to the surface since the time of Bergenworth and allowed the choir to have audience with Abritus. Wow. Abritus was the left behind Great One, who came to reside below the Grand Cathedral. We are told that the Grand Cathedral is the birthplace of the Healing Church's special blood, mm. and if the Church were indeed using the blood of the Great Ones, then who's to say it wasn't Abritus's blood? The Augur of Abritus is one of the secret rites of the choir, used by the high-ranking members of the Healing Church. Use phantasms, the invertebrates known to be Augurs of the Great Ones, to partially summon abandoned Abritus. 
one of the few rites that allow one to directly utilize the power of the Great Ones and evidence that the choir had approached the Eldritch Truth. Bro. <laughs> this video is so well made and also... What the fuck? I wish I knew like all this stuff while playing, bro. Like I don't obviously it's kind of special that I'm learning about it now, having played it, but dude, it is so i I hate that I killed Abritas now, bro. Damn, we really just walked in there and 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 you know killed her after she went through all that. That's that's kind of messed up, man. <laughs> I am growing so much love for all the notes that we found. We found most of those notes and like while reading them, you kind of have these ideas, but when you put them into context, it's uh, it totally changes the game. It's it's really really cool how how everything's kind of connected and how many hints they kind of give give you. But unless it's stated like this, someone like me obviously wouldn't like put all the pieces together. But this is really cool so far, man. This story is clearly very very well written and, and thought out. I found it interesting how much the healing church had an impact on Yarnum, and that was something that I did pick up during the game, but I'm really now starting to think like how much actual power they must have felt and had and how the citizens must have seen the church. Like, I wonder if this happened in real life, like how people would perceive that church and if people would be inclined to taking this blood. I, 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 that's, I don't know, just, just a wild thought. I'm sure we'll get into like how, when, when the transformation started happening for people that took the blood, but this is this so far is, is awesome i love the music that he's using it really captivates you and like it, it it creates this like really eerie feeling while watching this it fits bloodborne so well this guy clearly knows his uh his shit the ogre of abritus is an arcane method of fighting that was actually shared with the second subsection of the healing church the school of mensis the upper echelons of the healing church are formed by the school of mensis based in the Unseen Village. This fight was this so annoying. This brings us to our next important character, Mikalash, who was likely the head of the School of Mensis. Hmm. The School of Mensis was, as the name implies, a place of learning, research, and experimentation for the Healing Church. Their student set reads, the Healing Church has its roots in Bergenworth and naturally borrows heavily from its uniform design. The school was based below Yarnum in a place called Yahagul, the Unseen Village, Clearly, the work of Mensis was intended to be kept a secret from the people of Yarnum. In fact, as time went on, the school increasingly seems to have been working alone, even separately from the healing church itself. The Yahagul attire tells us, the hunters of Yahagul answer to the village's founders, the school of Mensis. Hmm. Hunters in name only, these kidnappers blend into the night wearing this attire. These were not true hunters. That title was saved for the third subsection of the Healing Church, the Hunters of the Workshop. Mm. These capable warriors of the Church appeared as the Scourge of the Beast began to show in Yarnum. The Workshop Hunters served under German, the first hunter, who nice. you're all familiar with. Papa the Hunter G. Attire reads, One of the standard articles of Hunter Attire fashioned at the Workshop, a fine piece of Hunter Attire that provides stable defense to anyone facing Yarnum's beastly threat allows one to stalk beasts unannounced by cover of night. It's possible the unannounced part of that sentence is to do with killing beasts without them noticing you, but it could also be because the workshop was a secret institution. The original workshop is located in a very hard to find part of Cathedral Ward. And we found it. it. You don't want the townsfolk believing that the blood is turning them into beasts. When that information is floating around, you want to avoid panic at all costs. So the hunters hunted beasts under the cover of night, but the hunters and the beastly scourge couldn't stay a secret forever. In what would come to be called Old Yarnum, a new disease appeared. It was called Ashen Blood. I call it a disease, but the small medicinal tablets used to treat it actually counteract poison. A tablet used to treat Ashen Blood, the baffling sickness that ravaged Old Yarnum long ago. These tablets only provide short-term relief. Mm. The ashen blood ailment eventually triggered the spread of the beastly scourge. Think about that. We know that the old oh. blood heals every illness. We know that the old blood causes the beastly scourge. And we now know that the ashen blood caused the beastly scourge to spread. Shit. In short, it seems like people were infected with the ashen blood and the medicine that they had only provided short-term relief, and they were forced to imbibe the old blood instead. It's even possible that the healing church used this ashen blood to gain power, swooping in with this miracle cure and liberating the people from the ashen blood disease. 
Since ashen blood seems poisonous in nature, perhaps the church even poisoned the populace just for that excuse to use the old blood. Because that excuse to get the populace to believe in you, that would have been so powerful. But whatever the case, the beastly scourge was triggered overwhelmingly in Old Yarnum, we know that much, to the point where they actually had to burn it down and cordon off Old Yarnum from the rest of the city. Whoa. The red moon hangs low and beasts rule the streets. Are we left no other choice than to burn it all to cinders? With this. Oh man, after doing my old Yarnum playthrough, I was looking for a thumbnail and I noticed that you could actually burn the beast that was hanging in the middle of that area that we just saw. And I was so bad that I missed that. Oh, I'm, I'm starting to look at the game like just differently, you know? Like, I actually believe the church would do that. Spread the infection for them, in order for them to gain more power. I feel like they would so do that. Crazy that it all started in uh, old Yarnum. That is, uh, that's pretty awesome. I was wondering why the place literally was just ruins. Like, I guess that answers my question, but... Pretty awesome, man. Pretty awesome. The hunt became known to all. Perhaps the church feared an uprising from the people of Yarnum, for a note in central Yarnum reads, When the hunt began, the healing church left us, blocking the great bridge to Cathedral Ward as old Yarnum burned to the ground that moonlit right. night. We as a we result, read that. German's workshop was sealed and closed. With the scourge of the beast known to all, perhaps there was no need for secrecy anymore. The Saw Hunter badge comes to read, Badge crafted long ago at the workshop, attests to one's prowess as a hunter of beasts. The workshop is gone, and no group recognizes this meaningless badge. At this point, the church retreats. They block themselves off in Upper Cathedral Ward, and come up with a new strategy for dealing with the scourge of the beasts that is spreading throughout Yarnum. Eventually, the workshop hunters would disband, and the church founded the Church Hunter Workshop in its place. Mm. Ludwig was the chief hunter of the Healing Church, which consisted of hunters garbed in black nice. and white. The Black Church Hunter attire reads, Most Healing Church hunters are elementary doctors who understand the importance of early prevention of the scourge, achieved by disposing of victims, even potential victims, before signs of sickness manifest themselves. Their black attire is synonymous with fear, and that peculiar Yana madness. Jesus. The Black Church Hunter's job was clear. Remove any sign of the Scourge of the Beast, even if it hasn't manifested itself yet. The fear that it inspired in the citizens shows most in Upper Cathedral Ward are deathly afraid of the Church. The White Church Hunter's jobs were a bit different. These doctors are superiors to the Black Preventative Hunters and specialists in experimentally backed blood ministration and the Scourge of the Beast. They believe that medicine is not a means of treatment, but rather a method of research, and that some knowledge can only be attained by exposing oneself to sickness. Their experimentation might explain the monstrously large church giants who would have been particularly useful in the fight against the beasts. <laughs> yeah. Ludwig's greatsword exhibits several departures from the workshop's design, suggesting that the church anticipated much larger inhuman beasts. On top of this, Ludwig took a much more overt approach to beast hunting. Nightly, he would embark upon central Yarnum, across the Great Bridge, to fight back against the beasts. But he was not alone. The population of central Yarnum joined the hunt as well, swelling the ranks of the hunters. Ludwig, the first hunter of the Healing Church, once recruited Yarnumites to serve as hunters. Huh. This hunter's attire was made for new recruits and has excellent straightforward defense, but not nearly enough to allow an ordinary man to stand any real chance against the beasts. It sounds like a very clever move, as it probably stopped the populace blaming the church and likely formed more of a us versus them mentality. Cool. Meanwhile, in Bergenworth, Master Willem had an epiphany. We are thinking on the basest of planes. What we need are more eyes. More eyes. <laughs> Willem took this very literally. The remaining students of Bergenworth appear to have been transformed into multi-eyed, fly-like creatures. And more Gross. importantly, Willem himself found an umbilical cord of a great one, which was a very significant and powerful artifact. Provost Willem sought the cord in order to elevate his being and thoughts to those of a great one by lining his brain with eyes. The only choice he knew if man were ever to match their greatness. Used to gain insight, and so they say, eyes on the inside, although no one remembers what that truly entails. It's difficult to know exactly how Willem came across or created an umbilical cord, so we'll have to go into that in another video. Just know that he has one for now. 
When we encounter Willem, he directs us to the Great Lake. The power of great bodies of water is actually referenced in a few runes. Great volumes of water serve as a bulwark guiding sleep, and an augur of the Eldritch Truth. Overcome this hindrance, and seek what is yours. Nice. The lake, and what lies within it, Ugh, hides the truth. Gross. Rom, the Bergenworth spider, <laughs> lies within. And there's a lot we don't know about her, but I'll tell you what we do know. The Bergenworth spider hides all manner of rituals, and keeps our lost master from us. A terrible shame. The spider is certain to reveal nothing, for true enlightenment need not be shared. I believe this is what the vacuous part of Rom's name refers to. This creature is somehow hiding the true nature of the world, and when you defeat it, you don't need insight to see the world for what it truly is. The night moves forward, the blood moon descends, and after killing Rom, we are finally granted access to what remains of Yahagul, home of Mikalash and his school of Mensis. The school of Mensis appears to have grown apart from the healing church and the choir. There is little information on Mikalash and his school, but we can prove that there was a split. Firstly, Mikalash uses the Augur of Abritus, a secret rite of the choir shared among the high-ranking members of the healing church. This suggests he was trusted with this information and was once a sane member of the church. To prove that there was a split between the Healing Church's choir and the school, we note clear signs of distrust and fighting between the groups. Mm. Imprisoned inside Yahagul is the corpse of a member of the choir, and inside the Nightmare of Mensis, we find who the official guide calls Edgar, choir intelligence. Mm. Clearly, the choir was suspicious of what was going on in Yahagul with the school of Mensis. I was wondering what that was. Based on what we find there in Yahagul, it seems the choir had good reason to be. The School of Mensis were attempting to commune with the Great Ones, and they succeeded. As Willem did, they found an umbilical cord. We find four cords in the game that allow contact with the Great Ones, and Mikalash had one. This cord granted Mensis audience with Murgo, but resulted in the stillbirth of their brains. As we know, most Great Ones reside in the Nightmare Realm, and whatever ritual they performed with this cord ripped Mensis and its students into a nightmare. Jesus. That's why you find the lecture hall in the nightmare, and that's why there's hundreds of dead students throughout Yahagul, all wearing the cage that appears to have delivered them to their harrowing nightmare. Mikalash's corpse provides a gateway into the nightmare, and we find him here, clearly insane, wandering the halls. <laughs> Most Mikalash annoying boss believes that it's possible time. to ascend towards becoming a great one, citing Rom as his example. Rom, however, is not fully developed, rather, she has the blood of their kin. Hmm. And let's just go back to Rom for a second. When you defeat Rom, Queen Yarnum appears. She's a Tumerian woman who has clearly suffered a childbirth gone horribly wrong. Mm. She is linked to the nightmare of Mensis, to the ritual I was right. Rom was hiding. And she appears in this nightmare, looking up towards Murgo's loft, where Murgo and his wet nurse reside. Queen Yarnum hails from the Tumerian civilization that was in power long ago, and she was blessed with a child of the Great Ones. From the way she appears outside Murgo's loft, it is clear that her consciousness, her spirit, was pulled into this nightmare as well. Even when you encounter Queen Yarnum's real self oh, in the Tumerian tombs, oh. the baby Murgo screams whenever you hit her. What? And even when you kill That's Yarnum so cool. in the tombs, it is clear that she is not actually dead. But her horrific consciousness is only asleep, and it stirs in unsettling motions. Whoa. Her consciousness seems to be showing up here in the nightmare, completely separate from her physical form. The same thing is happening with you, with Mikalash, with the Great Ones in the nightmare with you. You all exist in this nightmare that Mensis created. So your next question is, which Great One impregnated Yarnum with Murgo all those years ago? I believe it is formless Erdan. Whoa. The Great One Erdan, lacking form, exists only in voice. To cite the fastest evidence to present, there's nothing in the cradle after you defeat Murgo, and Murgo himself, the child, has no form. Also, mm. his cries are heard throughout your adventure. He exists everywhere. Additionally, Murgo's wet nurse has no form under those robes. And also, the women that are impregnated when this blood moon descends are all related to Erdan but we'll get to that in another video. Damn it. When you defeat Murgo's wet nurse, you get a message unlike any other that you've received thus far. Instead of prey slaughtered, you get nightmare slain. Yeah, I was you wondering You defeated that. a true great one Holy that's shit. elevated its consciousness to the nightmare realm, and the game is nearing its end. However, all of this should make you think, the nightmare of Mensis isn't the only dream world I've set foot in, is it? 
This entire time, I've actually been journeying out from the hunter's dream, guided by lanterns that led me to Murgo and her wet nurse, all of which is made possible by German and his doll. Travel to the hunter's workshop in the waking world and seek the truth. Every great one loses its child and then yearns for a surrogate. Right. The third umbilical cord precipitated the encounter with the pale moon, which beckoned the hunters and conceived the hunter's dream. Next to the cord is the unanimated doll. Take a hairpin from this real doll and then pass it along to the doll in the dream. When you give her the hairpin, she sheds a single tear, which reads, Created from the shining silver doll tear, this blood gem is a quiet yet unfaltering friend that continually restores HP, the life essence of a hunter. Perhaps this doll's creator had wished for such a friend, albeit in vain. It's clear that German called upon the Great Ones using an umbilical cord, similar to the manner in which Mikolash did. The Great Ones that inhabit the nightmare are sympathetic in spirit and often answer when called upon. German, lonely and lacking purpose after the church had no more need for his workshop, must have called upon the Great Ones. A Great One responded, the pale moon presence, and imprisoned German within the dream. For while German sleeps, he utters this rare piece of dialogue that clearly shows he does not want to be here. That was so sad, man. Oh, oh Lawrence, Master Willem. Somebody help me. Wait. <laughs> so, German made a pact with that great one in exchange for him being trapped into this world. And, and, oh my god, okay, hold up, hold up. Let's just keep watching. <laughs> Unshackle me. Please, anybody, I've had enough of this dream. The night blocks all sight. Oh, somebody, please. So sad, man. This was the dream conceived. Well, the doll tells us that countless hunters have passed through here, and all of the graves tell us that as well. And Eileen and Jura both have dialogue that is testament to that fact. They talk about how they've been through this dream before as well. So why are hunters being sent through this dream, unable to pass away, just forced to go out into the world and kill beasts? It becomes clearer when you kill Murgo's wet nurse. You return to the hunter's workshop burning down, the dream's purpose fulfilled. Ergo, the purpose of your dream and your hunt appears to have been to slay a great one. Three endings are presented to you. The first. <sighs> German offers- wait, 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 before we get into the endings, dude. Oh my God, it's almost over, holy shit. Oh my God, that went by so fast, bro. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm barely spoken. <laughs> it's okay, we're here to just hang out. It's literally like an endless loop for all those hunters. Like if they weren't succeeding in order, like obviously the, the mission was to slay the great one. They weren't doing it, so they just kept they were just stuck in that freaking Groundhog Day effect of. But the tombs also. Wait, now I'm confused. No, right. Because the ending we got, you know, our tomb was still there, but we were reborn or re. I don't know. Let's let's continue. I'm sure they'll explain that. But... You away out this is of the so dream. Good. He asks you to accept your death. For if you do, then you'll awaken in the waking world of Yana. Right. And your consciousness will be no longer linked to the dream. The trophy for this ending reads. You lived through the hunt and saw another day. The second option is to reject German. Okay, so you lose contact with the dream, but you still go back to Yarnum. You still go back. And does that mean they just you lose the link to the dream forever? Now you now you just die in Yarnum? Is that is that what that means? Like, I don't know. Let's see. He suggests that to do so must be a decision caused by madness, and he pits his will against yours to forcibly remove you from the dream. All the while, he entreats you to accept your death and be freed from this dream. Mm. If you overpower German, we meet with the Moon Presence, the being that appears to have conceived this nightmare, just like the nightmare Murgo conceived. Mm. It embraces you, and in the cutscene to follow, we see ourselves performing the same role that German did, hosting the dream, likely a slave to the Moon Presence, or perhaps its surrogate child guiding hunters throughout this dream in an effort to slay other great ones. Oh, that's the trophy so for this ending reads, Captivated by the moon presence, you pledge to watch over the hunter's dream. There's one key thing you need to remember. The great ones are a race, but they're a race unlike any other. Each great one is entirely unique, and they do not necessarily work together. 
In fact, from the existence of the dream, I'm almost inclined to believe that the moon presence is hostile towards other great ones. Mm. In the third and final ending, you consume three umbilical cords and resist the will of the moon presence. Right. You overpower it, and in the cutscene to follow, the doll coddles <laughs> the being you have become. Right. You have ascended, truly, so as few have up, before man. you. The trophy description states, You became an infant great one, lifting humanity into its next childhood. Jesus. So after the end of all this, you probably still have questions. Yes. <laughs> what is pale blood? Why does the moon presence guide hunters towards killing beasts and great ones? Which ending is the good ending? For all this and more, you need to be subscribed to the channel. <laughs> I'll have another video out soon Done, analyzing brother. the endings. And from here on out, the channel should split into three main parts. There's going to be the lore hunting series, where we focus on one aspect of the lore and really figure it out. There's going to be Prepare to Cry, which is my favorite series. You guys mentioned that one a lot. Man, um, I am subscribed now, so <laughs> you got me, brother. Somehow he made 31 minutes absolutely fly by. I feel like I have such a better understanding of kind of how things started, why they happened, how they happened. I thought it'd be fun if we also check out some of the comments in this video, just see what people are thinking and uh, just get my thoughts on it. Bloodborne story in a nutshell. Willem, yo, humanity needs to evolve, but don't use the blood to do so. Lawrence, K, proceeds to use blood to do so. Everyone who uses the blood goes insane and mutates. Willem, pfft, idiots. Insight is the way to evolve. Everyone who uses insight goes insane and mutates. There was literally no escaping insanity. During my first playthrough, all I was told, a junta must junta. And so hunt I did. I just hunted everyone and everything in the game without a single clue on what's actually going on. Dude, I feel that. I feel that heavily. I just love how it starts as a Van Helsing-like setting, killing werewolves and other traditional bees. Then it takes a hard turn into Eldritch Horror. I love this stuff, man. I just wish I was better at the game. I would love a sequel. I wish I was better at the game. I feel that too, man. Yeah, dude, the transition from the first half of the game till we start to see those freaking little aliens in the Forbidden Woods was insane, bro. I remember I, I was I was drunk when I first saw those guys. Um, if you watched that episode. So, you know, but I just, I just, my brain cannot compute such a drastic jump from aesthetics and, and, and world setting and enemies. I don't know. The game absolutely took a turn once we hit the woods and, uh, it was really good. It was really well made. Um, but yeah, it, it felt like two different games. It was crazy. Moral of the story, never make a blood pack with someone you don't know, or else you may become infected with all kinds of diseases. Yes, guys, great advice. German sobbing in his sleep, begging to be released, rips my heart out of my chest. Yes. Someone as old as he is crying and begging for the nightmare to end. Just damn, it hurts to hear it. I remember that was the first thing I did in one of the episodes. And I was so excited, you know, every time I started Bloodborne episode, I was really excited. But that just threw me off for the entire episode. He really was just reaching out to his <laughs> to, to his buddies to, to come and help him and no one was coming. So, man, at first I, I really liked the ending where we submit ourselves and we die in the hands of German. But now thinking about it, with that ending, we didn't really free him from his pain and the nightmare that he was in. So I, I kind of want to retract my favorite ending, man. <laughs> now understanding a little bit better. I find the healing church's goal to be ironic, poetically so. They sought to harness power and knowledge far beyond their comprehension, hoping to ascend to a higher level of consciousness. But in the end, humanity is nothing but beast when compared to the great ones. And thus the old blood revealed humanity's true nature. At least that's how I interpret Bloodborne. Huh, that's a really cool point of view. I like that. After five years of playing this game over and over, delving into the lore and studying it like a Bible, and even claiming it as my favorite game, I finally realized the game's called Bloodborne because that's how the disease is spread. It's gone airborne, waterborne, and... <laughs> All right, dude. Yeah, I also didn't think about that. <laughs> no, I feel like an idiot too, bro. For some reason, I just kept thinking born as in like being born, but no, it's it's born. Yeah, like like, like something is airborne. It's, it's in the air. It's everywhere. <laughs> nice. Okay, we're going to end it at this one. You know the game's hell eccentric when the good ending is you turning into a space squid. <laughs> Dude. This game is just built different, bro. And dude, honestly, that's one of the endings that I've been thinking about the most. I can't imagine what it'd be like for a go through that whole night just to end up being a little tiny octopus. That just, that just makes you feel so uncomfortable inside, but it's a really cool ending. But I gotta say, my favorite ending is where we take German's spot. 
I think there is something so special about now becoming the host. But it does make you wonder, are we a slave to the moon presence now? And at what cost? Or its child, as he mentioned? I don't know, it's very interesting. Something else that I found really interesting was the fact that German made a pact with the Great One in order to have the doll because he was lonely. There was a line in the beginning of the game when, where German says that you can do anything you want with the doll. You're welcome to use whatever you find. Nice. Even the doll should it please you. Which totally threw me off and I didn't think much about it. And now I'm looking at this whole relationship a little bit differently, man. This is kind of messed up, bro. Like, what did he do to my sweet doll? <laughs> I guess German's the OG simp, if you think about it. I think I saw a comment or two about German taking reference from Maria, which I think was one of his students, which just, it's just so bizarre. Not really like, trying to wrap my head around. <laughs> I felt more connected to this game than most games where they hold your hand and they spoon feed all of it to you. It goes to show that when you have a good story, really good game mechanics and just an overall captivating environment and music, you really don't need all the fluff that most games have nowadays. It's, it's really, really cool, man. This game really kind of changed my perspective on the, on games as a whole. So yeah, man, that's kind of all I have. I kind of gave most of my thoughts at the end of the video rather than throughout. I was just really captivated by his storytelling and uh, the video itself. It went on really, really fast. I thought we were only at like 14 minutes by the time the video ended. So <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this little lore video. I, I haven't done much of these. I'm sure I'll get better in the future because I do want to do all of these for all of the Souls games uh, in the future. So. Yeah, thank you so much for recommending it. Let me know if you'd like me to check out another one. I think his Prepare to Cry series would be a lot of fun to do here on the channel. So let me know if you'd be into that. And uh, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you. And I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.